All right. Good morning, and uh, thank you all for putting on your winter coats and coming out here this morning. Um, I'm really excited to uh, introduce our guest today, Professor Eric Christensen. Um, Eric is a professor of physics and astronomy, and he's the department chair of natural sciences at uh, uh, South Florida State College, where it's nice and warm and sunny. And um, uh, Eric holds uh, engineering degrees from the U.S. Naval Academy and uh, MIT, no less. So uh, he's had a he's had his previous career as a naval officer, uh, a deep sea diver. Uh, his last tour of duty was commanding officer of a research vessel. Uh, so he's had a an exciting career there, and now he's come to make classrooms just as exciting. I don't know if. He, that's possible, deep sea diving and all of that stuff, but it, uh, he is certainly giving it a, a full effort to make his classroom exciting. We met Eric uh, in New Orleans last summer. Gina Christopher, Mark Kemp, and I went to the SACS uh, COC summer conference, and the last thing we were expecting to uh, see was something exciting and useful, and um, that was a joke. And, uh, and um, <laughs> We saw Eric. Mark came out of one of the sessions and said, that guy is really good, and uh, that guy was that guy. And so he encouraged us to go see him. And, you know, the flipped classroom stuff has been around a while now, and I've, I've heard speakers, I've gone to conferences, I've watched videos, I've met people, I've read papers, and a lot of it that I see is a sales pitch, trying to say, hey, you know, this flipped classroom is really cool, and it talks about, you know, some of the potential benefits for students. But what we saw with Eric was, it was almost like a little mini documentary. It wasn't a sales pitch of you should do this and your students, the world is going to change, you know, for your students. And all. It was just a, a little documentary of one guy trying to make his classroom a bit more exciting. And he really got into, for the first time for me, the nuts and bolts. I've been in the college classroom for over 20 years. And Gina Christopher, the same way. It just, what he said resonated with us as people who are in the classroom. He said the things we would need to know and want to know if we were teaching in a uh, flipped classroom. And so um, I, I, I'll, I'll stop right there and just say that uh, I'm proud to introduce Eric as a flipped classroom hero. Uh, he's been declared by Learning Pod as a flipped classroom hero, and I think that's a, a great title for him. Uh, so I ask you to give a, a very enthusiastic and friendly JSU welcome to Professor Eric Christensen. Well, thank you. It sure is a pleasure to be here. You know, in true military fashion, I prepared for this. I turned, I cranked the air conditioner down really low at home and in, in my car. It still didn't prepare me for the cold we have here. So I'm just excited to share with you how it's so transformed, it completely changed the dynamics of my classroom. The excitement that I have now has reinvigorated my excitement for teaching and my students. At the end of the hour, I have to tell them it's time to leave. I have to almost push them out the door because I have other students coming in. I've never had that before. My office hours, I don't, I mean, they're the constant. There's a flow of students the whole time. Never had that before either. So there's something magical happening. I want to share with you real briefly what I'm doing, but then get into a bunch so you'll walk away with a bunch of ideas. Maybe, you know, my goal would be if you could take a couple of these and try them in your classes, I would feel that my time here was well spent. So we'll see how things go. So we'll start off here. <clears throat> it was a dark night, and the policeman just turned the corner. And, and it was a little misty, and there was a man on his hands and knees searching frantically in the light. So the policeman went over and said, Sir, what is wrong? How can I help you? He said, Oh, please, I lost my wallet. I just sold my car. I had $16,000 in that wallet, and I've lost it. So the policeman gets down, and they both search all through the light there. They don't find the wallet. So the police says, Let, let's think about this little. Where do you remember last seeing it? Where do you think you lost it? He said, oh, I, I lost it over there, but the, the light is better over here. <laughs> and that's so typical. When, when we're looking for new ideas, we look at things we know that we've done before that are proven and so forth. What, what, this, what I'm trying to help you today is think to look beyond the light. Look, stretch, go where you haven't been before. There might be some really great tools. With technology now, it really has opened a lot of doors. So that's kind of my opening passion or vision for you to think, make, take a leap of faith. 
I went to a conference and learned about flipped learning. I started doing it. I told the students, I'm going to do this next semester. They said, no, no, do it right now. Do it you know, uh, the very next semester. So I, I, I started doing it, uh, jump, jumped in with both feet. Of course, I had to work a lot in the late in the evenings to get everything ready each day, but it was well worth it. To see students that were getting C average before suddenly got A average. It was just, it was amazing for me. So I know that that was good. And I'll share with you some of the statistics of my classes. So here's just my little background. Uh, Joe told you all about that, but I do teach for two schools. I teach for South Florida State College where, where I'm a full-time faculty. I'm also an adjunct at Florida Keys Community College. I teach astronomy online for them. And that's really good. And I'm a real strong proponent of open educational resources. So any course that I teach, there's no textbook. I'm trying to increase the access for my students. So the only fee they have to pay is what the college charges. Everything else is provided uh, digitally on, online for them. I've created a back channel if you would like to. Um, and there's also on the, if you, hopefully you got one of these sheets, there's a QR code if you have a phone or a tablet that you want. There's also the, the address right here where you can just chat among yourselves. You can pose questions. I have my iPad up here and I'll sort of monitor those too. Maybe you don't want to uh, raise, you know, voice or you just want to chat with someone, hey, this would be something cool. So that's just for, you, for your, your enjoyment or, or, or use, however you, however you deem you'd like to do that during, during the presentation. It's a super one. If you teach a large, my classes typically are 12 to 20 students, so I wouldn't need something like this in that class. But if, if I had a class of 50 or 100, I might set up one of these in the class that students could chat or, or pose questions while you're lecturing or while you're doing other things. And they could, you know, they can learn as much from their peers often as, as from instruction from you. So just another, another tool you might want to consider if you teach a large class. So I did, made a note-taking guide. I know when I go to a conference, I take notes on everything. Even if I throw those notes away when I walk out the door, I will remember things better than if I just sat there and passively, you know, and listened to things. So don't know how you operate, but I wanted to give you that opportunity. So, so on this page, there, there's a bunch of the, the topics that we're going to be covering. You could say, you know, um, what is it? How could I use it? Or whatever you'd like. But that was what I thought might be of, be of help later on, you'd remember. The flipped classroom allows you to engage students in a multiple different ways. And that, the sum is they were pointing there. Those are ways they're going to they're see in, the, in their future jobs. So uh, the flipped classroom is a kind of more of uh, lifetime learning, because they're learning stuff more on their own and then applying it at the job place or in the classroom. So I think it mirrors what they're going to see. You're, you're better preparing students for the future. This, this presentation comes with a warning. Okay, Some of these ideas, if you adopt them, they could in lead to increased student engagement, motivation, and retention. So you've been warned. If you don't like that, you know, maybe you should leave. But otherwise, um, we're going to move forward. So that's the physics professor warning. So here's the problem that I saw uh, that I've seen in my classes in the past, that students just can't, don't, or won't. You know, they won't study. They won't do their homework. Uh, sometimes it's not even coming to class. Although, since I flipped, that has changed completely. So um, I had to find a solution. And does this sound familiar to you? My students don't. My students seem to always come to class unprepared. They don't look at anything before. You know, it took me to graduate school to realize if I read a little bit before class, it would make a lot more sense. Well, the flip really forces that into them. But this could be, perhaps this is why that, if they don't expect to be engaged, if they expect to come to class just to sit there, you know, open their head and you pour in the information, that's what they're going to do. They're just going to come there and they might do some texting or something on the side. So you need to do something. You need to change it around, maybe flip it around. Um, here was a study done by Crazy for Education. I don't have all the details on how they did this. this they, they studied the brain activity, and they put little sensors on, on student brains. Uh, point your, to the red box there, which is typical in class. You can see very little, um, can you see all right? I, okay, very little uh, brain activity. But when they're actively engaged, which is kind of what you would do with the flipping, is the green box. But what's most surprising, look, when they're sleeping, there's more brain activity than when they're in class. We got to change that. There's something just not right with that. So here's a solution that really works for me. Uh, it's not a new solution. It's been around for a long time. I was talking to my president, my past president at my college uh, last week. He said he tried something like this you know, 30 years ago, and it worked well for him. But now we have the tools of technology where you can take a screencast of your, of your PowerPoint. You, this, there's a lot more engaging things you can do. So it's really, we're, 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 it's on steroids, what, what we're doing. 
Um, but we're basically flipping. We're taking what students typically would do in class, we're having them do that at home or before class. And what they would typically do at home, we're doing that in class. It's a major change. You have to be sure students understand these are the expectations. You can't come here not have done anything before class because you won't be ready. And they'll see that. Their peers will move forward and they'll be struggling. And I see that. I see some students I know have more talent. And if they didn't do what they were supposed to before class, they're, 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 they're going to struggle in that class. And they, they, they really they, they fess up to that pretty quickly. They understand. They see where it's going on. So my inspiration came last year. I was at the Sloan Sea International Conference on Online Learning. It's every year in Orlando, which is just two hours north of where I live. And uh, there was a presentation by San Jose State University in their electrical engineering department, where they partnered with the online lectures that MIT had. They basically put all of their lectures online in their EDX program. So they took these online lectures, and they just would they used that for their classroom. Then in class, they applied, did the problems, helped the students in, in the parts they didn't understand. And look at the pass rates. They increased from 55 to 91 percent. So I said, gosh, if I could mirror just a portion of that, I would be, be very happy. So I did. I went back, showed my students. I started flipping almost, almost the next month. I started this last spring in, in two of my physics classes. A very successful, I'll share the, the, I have the full statistics for that. This semester, I'm doing three classes. So I'm really burning the midnight oil, but I'm doing my two other, because the physics is a, is a one year sequence. And I'm also teaching an intro to astrobiology course this semester. And I flipped that. So the, the physics is much more uh, quantitative and the uh, astrobiology is qualitative. So I know many of you come from a lot of different disciplines, but it, it, this doesn't just work for, for, for uh, quantitative. But my examples are probably more focused on that because that's what I do in my class. But it could be applied to, to any discipline. In fact, uh, it's really big. Flipping is very big in the high schools. It's been going on for a while. They're even doing this now in grade schools. There are grade schools that are, doing, are flipping their class. So it's, it's sweeping the nation, uh, but for good reason. So here's some of my results. I'm going to go through these kind of quickly. But this is how my students felt before I flipped, the traditional. They would get home to do their homework. They usually don't start till like 2 in the morning. And they don't know where to go. They don't know where to start a problem. So they can't complete it. They don't know what to They can't call me. Can't e they'll email me, but I'm not going to. I don't wake up in the middle of the night to check my email. So they're frustrated. And then they come to class. Then we have to spend more time going over them, or I would post the solution online for them. But that's not the same as getting immediate feedback, you know, the just in time. When they have a problem, if I can be there right then and tell them, no, th think about this. What about, you know, Newton's second law or something? It really engages them much better. Now that they're flipped, now these aren't my, I found this picture online here, but my students are like that. They work in groups. I do see more smiles than I see frowns in my class. I know they're getting it, and the fact that I have to push them out the door at the end of the class means that they're finding value in class. And more and more students, I have very few absences because students want to come to my class. In my astrobiology class, students bring guests. They bring a friend. I never had that before. It's not the college policy, but I let them come. If they want to come, bring someone. Maybe they'll take my class next, next semester. So here's the failure rates. Mine went, I typically, this was like a three or, three or four year average. About a fifth of my students failed my uh, Physics two class. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's a hard class, and you know I get a couple A's and some B's, um, but none of them failed when I flipped the class. So I said, maybe not the same as San Jose, but um, I'm on the right track there. This was the class average. It increased to 28%. Before it was you know a mid C or low C. Now it was a B average for the, the whole class as, as a whole. Here's the grade distribution if you want to see a, a, a graphic there. And you can see that it, the A students are going to get A's regardless of what you do. They're, they're, they, they know how to study. And so those, this, this really wasn't helping the A students, although I don't think it hurt them. Because when you do a lot of that peer teaching, you know, when you have to explain something, that's when you really know you learned it. So I know that they were, they were getting good. And they don't complain at all. So I know that's working. But if you notice the, the lower side, the, the students that were really struggling, it really gave them a boost. And I had uh, one of our statisticians uh, help me with some statistics. And you can read all those. And I don't know how deep you are in those. But the bottom line is that the p-value for the man Whitney U was less than 0 0.05, which means it's statistically significant, the differences between my class the previous years and that semester. So I'm going to leave that. If you're into, you know, I'll be glad to talk you offline on those. But, and again, the sample size might not be that large, but that, that's what I have. That's, I have one, one class. Uh, each, each term. 
So 95% of my students come to class. So I, I will miss one student out of 24, I'll miss one student for, for whatever the, the child care or whatever their issue is. 93% of my students tell me that they are engaged or highly engaged in the class. I give them a, a Likert scale chart. Just tell me, you know, I do it like every test. I always give them a, give them a little uh, survey on things, how things are going. 93%, they're self-reporting. 92% of them turn in their homework. I was getting, I offered extra credit. If you did the homework, I'd give them extra credit. I only had a third of the students do it. Now I get 92% do it. And I just kind of look at it for, for effort. I don't even really grade all the things. I do a three, two, one, you know. Three, it looks really good. Two, it's, it's, there's some errors. One, they, they tried a couple of them. And then obviously zero for nothing. But that's all I do. But I got that much out of them. 77% of my students, and this is over multiple times, self-reported that they had studied over one hour before each class, which I thought was, was good. I mean, the, the more the better, but an hour, that, that's pretty good. And I was able to complete the same amount of material three weeks earlier than normal, which is significant. You know, 16 weeks, I was able to cut it. I could have sh shut the door down and said, we're done, you know, and, and, but you know, my dean would have had a, had a heart attack. So what I chose to do was I integrated some review sessions. Before each test, we would have an extra day that we would do, do some more review things. I'll talk a little more about what I do there. But you actually could, some, some instructors that flip just say, well, every Friday or every other Friday, we won't have class to make up for the time that you're doing, because they're spending more time outside of class doing what you normally do. Um, but I didn't, my students want to be there as much as they can. They, they, when, I'm, when the class isn't there, they ask me to get the key, and they go in the classroom and work on the board all on their own, and I pop in and see them. So I know my students are, are excited. So it certainly increased class attendance, class enthusiasm. I've mentioned that. Office hours, they're, they're, they're all the time. My, there's a steady flow. Increased email. I have to read my email more now. Um, so increased student engagement in and out of class. They're also meeting out in town. They meet in a coffee shop, and so to, to, all, to group study. So, I feel that they're getting a lot more fun. They're definitely more engaged. It's a lot more exciting for me than just going there, going through the lectures, and then grading papers. You know, here I'm engaging. Um, I'm not presenting to a whole class, actually presenting multiple times, one-on-one, -on -one, just where they need it. You know, I've, so I know every student by name. Um, I get to talk to each one at least three times during each class period, find out where they're struggling. I know what, what, what their strengths and weaknesses, and I can give them that little bit of advice or what they need to do. Um, my students will come. They might be doing last week's homework. Some are doing, most of them are doing today's, but some, some, you know, some are more advanced than others. It doesn't matter. So my mind has to quickly shift because I, I'm looking at 10 different problems at one time as I walk around. So that really keeps me agile and, and it's, it's exciting rather than same old problem. You did the same mistake, you know, 10 people in a row. It's never that way. So what is Flip? It was started by John Bergman and Aaron Sams from a high school in Colorado. They're chemistry instructors. Did they come? Did, did John come here? Not, here? not here. OK. So flipping class is not doing flips in front of your class, OK? It's, it's flipping how instruction is changed. So what's done at, the home, at home is done in school. What's done, that's my, that's my building where I teach, is done, done at home. So traditionally, instruction, students would probably, there's some boredom in class, you know, just taking notes, they're quiet, not engaged, you know, very little brain activity. Uh, then outside of class, they're struggling. At least my students would struggle. Physics is not easy. It's hard to teach it, and it's probably harder to learn it. Um, and the instructor would be the sage on the stage, which is a traditional model for an instructor. Whereas with the flip model, it's very personalized. The students, I take a screencast, uh, you know, use an online tool, which I'll talk a little bit more, of the PowerPoint, so they can watch a video of me going through the PowerPoint, a redu reduced amount from what I normally would do in the classroom. They can rewind it, so if they didn't get it the first time, often different students learn at different rates, and some students don't even watch the videos. They can just read the book. So it offers for different modalities because everyone has different learning styles. So that's really a really good part about it. Uh, they're engaged in class. They've told me that. If you walk by my class, people are running around. They're, they're moving their chairs from here to there. Very noisy. Um, it would look very chaotic would probably be the best way to describe my class. But it's exciting, too. You can, you can, feel, you can feel a sense of excitement. And so I'm the, the guide on the side. I li literally probably should start wearing tennis shoes because I just, I just make my rounds and go around and wait for someone to raise their hand, and I go back and forth. And so very personal, if you, you know, you're one-on-one -on -one right in the face of a student, uh, which I think is good. 
So what's the best use of classroom time? Well, here's how I uh, structured my class. You know, th this is the typical uh, Bloom's taxonomy. Obviously, the, the lower, the lower two, two levels, uh, that's what you should do, at least I feel, should be done before class. Their first exposure, they could read about it, they can watch it and get, get the concepts. Self-paced, so they can go really quick or they can go repeat it as they need to, especially you know, if, if the English is their second language, you know, they might need to, to study a little bit more. During class, I strive for a deeper understanding. We, I try for application. Now that you've got the theories, I don't, ever, I don't have to teach Newton's three laws now. I just give them an example. How does it apply? Tell me how you apply each of those. And if they don't know, I say, well, you, that was in your reading. You know, you go figure that out. You know, so, um, and then they get individualized support, both from me and also from the, their peers, because they work in groups of, you might set up with tables of three, but it usually ends up tables of six and they move all around. After class, build confidence. I try to give them, well, now you've worked together. I've helped you. Other students help you. Go home and do another problem and do it all on your own. So they get a chance to, to flex and do, do what they're learning, but to apply it to sure that they really got it. And then I like to do a reflection. That's where the online discussion boards are really good. I pose a question, what, what's the most important thing to know about this, or how would you solve this type of problem? Then I always ask, what questions do you still have? What's still unclear for you? Then I make every student read and reply to at least one of them. This is, what I, it took this, this is what I do in my online class. And so they're engaging each other and they're answering their own questions. Because someone will have the answer. You know, and so um, I, do, I don't have to really answer those much, but they, they work between it. If they don't get it, then the next day I can talk about it in class. So um, here's some reasons, I'm not going to go through those, but why you should flip your class. I've hit on most of these things. But inter interaction will skyrocket, both between students, which is really good, especially if you have for, you know, uh, especially if they're you know freshmen or so, to get them engaged, um, and you'll get more feedback. Student benefits, a bunch of different things, more engaged, personalized learning. Uh, I think it says you have better grades. I mean that's that's probably the last thing I really worry about, but it it, it just happens naturally because of all of the other things. Faculty benefits, okay. I'm going to just skip. It's more fun to teach, and I definitely, you know. Well, I'll talk, okay. So who's flipping? Well, here's a number of schools, not only the Big East schools, but you know, uh, Harvard, Princeton, MIT, Stanford, San Jose, South Florida State College. So my question, what about JSU? Maybe that's something for you that you might consider. You don't have to flip a whole class. I mean, it's great, but you could just do flip Fridays. You know, one day a week you flip a class or one topic in your, in your thing. Hey, for this coming topic or this chapter, I'm going to have, we're going to do a little different, and you can see how that's a good way to test the water before you, before you jump in, because and, and, it, it, is, it is a lot of work to get everything ready, but once you get going, the beauty of it is a lot of the stuff will be reusable, so I know next year, when I, next spring, I already have flipped from the last spring, I'll have a lot of reusable things, the work will be a lot less to get ready. So how do you do it? So here's, here's kind of where I want to get more into the tools and techniques and things that I do. It's a mixture of high tech and low tech, depending what, what you're comfortable with, what you have. You know, you might not have fancy clickers and all that. There's plenty of other ways to do clickers. Videos are great. Students love them. Not every student will watch the video, but um, that's okay if they can get it some other way. Some will watch. And I tell them, if you find a good video on YouTube or, or, or Khan Academy, let me know. I'll post a link to it for other students. So it could be self-perpetuating. You can get good, do things. A lot of group. Uh, Discussions, you can have live presentations, you can break up into groups. Okay, you guys, you have half an hour, and then you're going to present to the rest of the class on, on something that you're applying what they read beforehand, whether it's, you know, some, some legal things or how do you, you know, something in writing, perhaps. Classroom discussions, uh, written exercises. I'm really strong on getting my students to, to do more writing, though m most of my course is, is, is problem solving. So here's the strategy that I've developed and the techniques that I go. Before class, I have both collaborative and individualized work. The collaborative is an inquiry. I try to throw up a polling question or what do you think? Predict what's going to happen when this happens. So they start thinking about the topic before they've ever even got into it. So they, and they'll talk between each other, maybe share, share comments on their discussion board. But then individualized, that's when, that's when they're getting what was typically the lecture. And they can get that from reading, from uh, the screen, the videos, video of the, of the PowerPoint. Sometimes just a podcast. You know, I'll, I'll just, just talk on my, if I don't have that. I also use a live scribe pen. I'll solve a problem where I'll, I'll talk through it. And they, they can wa walk through that and re repeat it. Uh, during class, it's a scaffolded engagement collaboratively where we start off with, I usually try to start with some activity or some application where I almost 
guide them hand by hand to get them to feel comfortable how they can use that. It's using like the, the laws or the equations that we're going to need. And then I turn them loose. Okay, now you have three problems to work on together. And then I roam around and there's always questions and, and which is fine. And then after class, it's more of the individualized reflection and then they have to comment. So it's a combination of both where they have to reflect upon what did they learn and how could they use it and what, what they still don't understand. So I made this little chart here. Here's kind of the techniques that I use. Before class, I have them read the textbook and watch the, the screencast videos. I make them no longer than 15 minutes. I use Screencast-O-Matic, which is limited to 15 minutes. If I needed one longer, I just make it two. I make it part A and part B. Then I have them, just reading the book is fine, but how do you know that they took anything in? So, so I have them do reading questions. And I have an example of that, but I use the Cornell note system. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, we're starting to use that more and more in our high schools, so it's a natural transition when they come to college. It's a way to force them to revisit their notes and come back. They write something, but then they have to come back and summarize it and find key points. But what I do is I give them, here are the five things I want you to get out of this reading or watching this video. These are the five most, because they tell me, I read the book, but I don't know what's important. Everything looks important to me, every word, you know. Well, no, there's certain topics. So I kind of guide them. Be sure you, you know, explain this, describe this, or if it's an equation, what is the equation for, for uh, weight, you know, and then what are the units and what are the variables? So then when they do their homework, they have a sheet that they, they'll see value in taking notes because they use those notes when they're doing the homework. They need that equation or they need that definition. So they're using it. So when they see that there's value, they start doing it. I first start off just giving them a quiz. I said, watch the, watch the PowerPoint and then take this 10 question quiz on the reading. They hated it and they complained. So I came up with this Cornell note idea and they started begging me, when, let's have that again. If I've missed a day, no, we want that. It re, they see real value in it. So I'll show you an example of that one. So that's kind of the first step that, that I do. Then they come to class where we do the collaborative act. That's the warm up. And it might be watching a short 10 seconds of a YouTube video where a ball is falling or something. Then we'll talk about what predict what's going to happen next or, or draw a free body diagram for the forces involved. You know, and I'll guide them along, write it on the board if they get stuck. I do a lot of ranking tasks. I have some sources where, you know, rank these things, which one is going to fall the fastest or, or so forth. Uh, and then they work in problem solving and they work together and I encourage them uh, and they really see the value in working with someone else. And even, even the more advanced students, the, the higher, they're fine with it and they're, they're, they're sharing what they know to the other students and they, they're seeing that it's helping them. And then, uh, again, as I talked about, the challenge afterwards, give them something that they have to do to turn in for the next time. So, uh, so before class, develop a sense of, of, of curiosity. So the online discussion board, what do you think will happen to this or what, what caused this motion or if it was a, what caused the war of 1812, let them write what they know, what they think they know about that. Um, I, physics, there's a lot of online simulations, so for me that's easy. Chemi any sciences, you probably can get a number of those. Online polling is great, like when you go on a website, there's usually a little poll where you can vote, what do you think about uh, Obamacare or whatever, and you, you can vote and see what other people voted. I do that in my online class a lot. Then there's online collaborative whiteboards. So um, you're probably, your L you all use Blackboard, I believe, right? Yeah, we use Desire to Learn, very similar to some, some subtle differences, but it has a, both of them have a discussion board, and you can use that, but they're used to that. So every once in a while, throw, try a different one, just, just for, you know, they, they'll, it, variety is the spice of life, you know, it's nice to see differently. Here's a number of different ones. VoiceThread is a great one where you can actually get a video, and they comment on the outside, and they can either do it on their phone, they can text a message, they can type something. Um, and there's some other ones there that you can see. And there's a resource guide that, that I've given Jenna and they'll have a list of all these so you don't have to, and this whole PowerPoint will be made available to you. So I should have told you that at the beginning so you don't have to, but, but you should be taking some notes so it'll be helpful for you. <laughs> Online simulations, um, these are wonderful. I use it from, from the University of Colorado. Again, they're, they're really physics and chemistry related, but there might be something in your different discipline. Uh, that part I don't know. Online polling, I use PollDaddy.com. It's from WordPress, it's super easy to use. Uh, like, even my dean t tells everyone I teach astrology, and I have to keep reminding her it's astronomy. <laughs> but uh, I make sure the students know that they're not taking an astrology class. So, 
I give them a poll there just to see what they think, you know, and, and they, they chat back and forth. It builds excitement. They're, oh, hey, what are we going to learn about this time? It's, it's, it's a neat thing. They're super easy. To, you can embed them as a widget right into your... I'm not sure at Blackboard. I know there's a way that you can do it. I, or you can just link to it directly. You can stay out in the cloud and you just link to it. S super easy to do. I set them up at the beginning of the semester for, for every class session and it's all set for the... I just clear them out from last year's because I want, I want fresh ideas and fresh voting. Padlet, and there's some other, that's like a, a blank uh, corkboard where you can post notes and then you give them a topic or a question and the students just, when they write it, it's like putting like a three, uh, one little sticky, sticky note and then they can be moved around and you can get them to categorize them. You could do that for an exam review or for anything. We're trying to brainstorming ideas. So um, then the, that's the, the, the building up the curiosity, excitement, but they also need to get some knowledge. They get, need to learn some new things. So uh, this is where we replace the traditional lecture. They're not going to come to me. But on occasion, in fact, two weeks ago, I did. I said, this stuff is too hard. It was rotational motion. I knew they were going to have trouble, so I did a regular lecture. But for the vast majority, I mean, that was the only time this semester that I have done that. Um, but so you, you feel free to, you know, you can flip-flop around. And they, they appreciated that. But we still did some of these other things. So, uh, but the more and more that you flip, they, they really, they've, they've gotten in the mode. They know what to expect. But I like them to have a sense of excitement. They never know what, when they're coming to my class, what we're going to start with. If they come in every day and it's the same old thing, take a quiz or pull out this, they're going to, you might get a little bored. But if they don't know what we're going to do, I might move the chairs all around or a different seating arrangement or something. Just some little excitement or, or different uh, activity. It, 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 that, I think they might come just to see what I'm, what, what's that guy coming up with today? Um, so, a series of structured assignments. I do the video lectures. Now, you certainly can just do a video, and I, I've done that. I have a flip camera, or you know, with with the laptops now, they have a built-in microphone and, and camera. You could just you could do a regular recording, or you could just take your um, PowerPoint and, and talk through it. And you can have it uh, with with your face if you want. If they want to see your face, you can have it also. If you use Screencast-O-Matic, which I'll talk, it can show you, you talking while they're seeing that, but maybe, maybe you're having a bad hair day or you don't want to do that. I, I just, just, just put the PowerPoint and they can go through that. Um, but you have to pair it with something. If it's just watching it, they might not do it, but if they know they've got to, they got to view it for a purpose. Or if they're reading, they got to read for a purpose. So the purpose is to answer this, this sheet because they're going to collect it then to make sure I collect those and I grade them. They're, you know, simple. I can grade them all in, in, in like 10 minutes. You know, the first 10 minutes in class, I just whip through them and I give them back to them. But they know I'm going to collect them. They have to have it done when they, that's sort of their ticket to come into class. So um, you can pair that with, you know, you can do a podcast. If you don't want to do the video thing, you, you could just talk. There's some good websites where you can, you can just record those. So videos, you certainly can use pre-made. The first semester, that's all I did. I didn't make any screencasts. I didn't, I just went on YouTube and, and searched for the topic and watched a few of them, picked two or three, said, watch these. So the different people, some were high school, some were from overseas. And, hey, they're, they're talking about the topic. Maybe, maybe it'll resonate listening to a different instructor than you. I know in the high schools, they're very adamant that the students hear you because you're, you're the instructor, they, you should be the one. In college and university, I think it's a little different. I think whoever can best relay it, if I can find something already made that really has, has my topic, I'm going with that. I'm not going to do my own thing. But um, So but here's a number of choices. The TED Ed. Uh, how many people know about TED Ed? OK, I'm talking about that's a really good site. You know, and you can put questions with it, and, and it'll even grade them for you. Or you can make your own. And uh, I am pushing Screencast-O-Matic because it is so super easy. And our, our IT folks, I don't know about yours, but we can't do anything to computer. You know, I can't even upgrade a, you know, Adobe Reader. I, they have to come and do that. But certainly can't install any software. But you don't need to install anything. It will run as is as long as you have a, you know, you buy a $5 headset with a microphone is all you need. Or, or if you run it from your uh, laptop, it would be no problem. So terrible name, but a great product. Uh, it's free. You can get up to 15 minutes, and you can store all your videos right there online on their website. So I have my whole semester. You can also down, you can get a link or an Im embed code or even download it as an MP4 if you actually want, you want to be sure that you have the whole file. But I leave it on their site. And you can categorize them you know, into groups. So I have each of my courses separated like that. So super simple. Try it out. I think you'll find it's so easy to use. Ted Ed, you know about that, so I'm going to move on. But that, that's the instructor for my online, uh, for my astronomy class. P 
podcast, here's a number of sites. Uh, I use audioboo.net. What I do in my online class, students seem to not know what to do each week, even though it's written down and I post it on do this, I give them a checklist. So I said, I'll do something else. Maybe they just want to hear it. So I pull the syllabus and I read from the syllabus for about a minute. I thought, this is the week, this is what I want you to do. Boom, boom, boom. And I talk about it. And I throw in a couple other things. Hey, we're having a star party. We're going to go look at the stars you know, on Thursday night or whatever. So it's a little personalized. And I post that. So if they're, if they're the audio type learner, they can click that. If they can just read it, Lord knows if they could just read the syllabus, it's all in there. But that's, that's a big, that's asking an awful lot. There, there are other sites that can go longer. Audioboo gives you three minutes, which it should be fine. But if you, if you get someone else to sign up, then you get another minute. But if you have multiple email addresses, just sign yourself up. That's what I did. So I have like seven minutes, now eight minutes, you know? So just I have my home email and a couple college addresses. So you can get more. But you don't want a really long uh, um, uh, podcast. So this is what the reading assignment, what mine looks like. And if you're interested all in Cornell Notes, just go on YouTube and, and Google, or just Google it. There's so many things that talk about Cornell Notes. It's very popular. We're part of the AVID, which I don't know if you've heard of that. It's a high school initiative that's nationwide. It's advancement via individual determination. It's an effort to get the students in the middle, not the brightest students and not the, the, the slowest students, but in the middle, to tell them, hey, you have to encourage them to go to college, that at least that they have the skills to go to college if they ch choose to. And so they have a lot of engagement activities. They've searched the web and the, and the resources and they come up with, with massive amount of, of references to use for active engagement. And uh, they push the Cornell notes very, very strongly. We're in a collaborative region because our middle schools, our, our high schools in our area and us are all in this program. And so we have meetings where we sit down. I sit down with middle school science teachers and we share what common problems we have. And the problems they have are very similar to the ones I have with students. Not, you know, yeah, it's, it's amazing that we, maybe on a different scale, but the, the issues are still quite the same. So um, anyways, there, there's the, the Cornell notes you can, that I, but again, I put questions. I embed it with questions to make them fill that. So that becomes their notes, because they're not coming to a lecture, so they might not have any notes if they're just reading the book. This sort of gives them a structured, a scaffolded way to take some notes. And you know that at least getting the, the things you think are most important. So the, here's a bunch of the warm-up activities. And I think I mentioned that, that I don't like to be predictable. I want to challenge them each time. So I'm going to go through, through a bunch of these to show you kind of things I do. I don't do all of them every time. But through the semester, I probably have hit each one of those. Some I do more often. So this is what I call the, a guided inquiry. Um, Again, that was a YouTube video. They were dropping balls in, in different liquids, and we were, we were learning about viscosity, you know, how long they took to fall. And so instead of doing the lab, we could have made a whole lab on this, but watch the video, just, just record it, and then um, figure out the velocity, and then we, we could figure out, you know, how fast it can figure out what liquids they were. And it did what, I had to help them a little bit, but they, they did both a quantitative and a qualitative. Then I had some questions about it. So we could do the essence of it. It could have been a whole lab. We could do it in 15 minutes. They loved it, and then we moved on. Then they, they applied it by doing homework problems. The jigsaw activity, these are really powerful. They take a little effort to set up, but when you do those, they're really cool. You start off, you, you group the students in probably four or five, and then within that group, they number off one to five. Then you, that's the home group. Then they split up, and all the ones go one place, all the twos, and then you give the, all the ones, you give them some activity to focus on one aspect of an issue. Uh, when I first learned this at, at a NASA workshop, we were doing uh, the plate tectonics. So one, one group looked at um, you know, um, fossils, one looked at soil samples, one looked at just the visual of the, the continents, how they fit together. So they study that you have an activity for that group to focus on one, one component of the topic at hand. Then they go back to their, their main group, and they all have to share. Then they have to answer a question or two. Every student has to talk because if you were number three, you've got to tell us what was number three about. You're, you're our expert on fossils, and you're our plate, te plate tectonics. The others didn't study anything about that. And then they share out. So there's a lot of engagement, um, and then it, makes, it forces everyone to have to say something, because otherwise they're going to let the group down. Um, try it a couple. It, it, it takes a little bit of time to do, but it can be really powerful. Gallery walk is another. You could have them either do all the same problem or different problems, then they post it around the room, then students go around and comment and correct them. You know, often they'll, 
And if they have the wrong solution, I leave it up there to see if someone's going to, and normally someone will get it by, by the end. So you do it on, uh, you could do it on the, the poster sheets, or, or I go to Home Depot and buy a shower board, these big white things, and just, they'll cut it for me, and, and then just post them around. They can, they can write on it, and really easy to erase, and real cheap. So that, that's a pretty powerful way to do it. At the beginning of a semester, I'll often do a, a matching exercise, uh, if, especially if there's a lot of terminology or vocabulary. I'll list those, and I'll put the, the answers on the other side, or, or what, the, what the equation, this was equations, because that's, that's more what I do work with. And then they had to match them. And then they had to go, if they, then they had to share with someone else, and if they, if they had the difference, well, you convince him of yours, and you convince her of yours, and then we would resolve it. But it's a good way to, to open up the, especially if they were coming in early to class or something, that's a, that's a really good activity. A five-word exercise. This is the one that I got from Avid. And I had the hardest time teaching density. Students just they couldn't grasp the concept. Gave them the equation. So I came up with this. It seemed to work mad, amazing. There were two pictures there, of what, what, you know, and they had to describe it. So you, you can take a picture of anything. And you say, OK, uh, five words to explain that image. So they have to think. One student, he's there writing their five words, what the, what's going on. Then they have to share that paper with someone else. They have to explain what that word is. How, so they have to explain the word. Then they give the paper back, and then they compare and contrast. And so you're getting to a pair of students to really engage with each other, trying to explain what that topic is. And it was amazingly powerful and, and effective. I thought it was kind of silly at first, but uh, it really worked. Or I do with a right-hand rule, where we do with, you know, we have a current through a wire, and you have a magnetic field around it. I would stand until I'm blue. I made YouTube videos to explain it. Well, I put a picture of a hand with a wire, and they had to explain it to each other. And it worked. In class polling, uh, you could use polleverywhere.com. I think you can get up to 40 uh, people can use that. And it will pop up right in your PowerPoint, which is really cool. You can, as they're live, if, if, if the students have cell phones or, or tablets or so that they can uh, vote with, there's the poll daddy. There's today, today's meet, what we have for, the, uh, for in here. You could use the ABCD cards. It's big in astronomy, especially in a large class. You give all the students a card and they just fold it to whatever color. So you just look. If you see a sea of, of, of green, you know everyone, the vast majority of the students pick B. And if that's the right answer, you move on. If you see a rainbow of colors, you know that they're not quite. This will work well with a think, pair, share type activity. Or I like to just use organic voting. Just have them hold their hands right in front, you know, one, two, three, or four. No one else can see it because they're all facing me. I can kind of look and get a real good judge of how the students have got that answer. That works pretty well, too. Carousel activity. This is a great way either as a review before an exam or at the beginning. But I know it's hot in here. I'm getting pretty hot up here. Um, you could post four questions around the room, and uh, you, you could have them go around and answer it, write down what they think, add to it, give them different colored markers. So then you, you can kind of see which group wrote. And so it's a really way to engage students together, plus with everyone in the class. You can go over them or, or just leave them. At the end, what they all do is they take their phones out and, and take pictures of it all. That's the beauty of doing any of these with the poster sessions. Um, we line them up on the board, and as they leave, they all just snap. And I, I post them online. If they don't, I say, send them to me, and, and we'll post them on the class website. Uh, I flipped my exam reviews. and I used to you know, prepare what I thought would help them for the test. And they, it didn't go very well, and I was never happy. So I changed it, and this works wonderful. I give them a three by five card the day before. Tell me what, you'd like, what you don't understand about this chapter. What would you like to cover in the review? And whatever they say, I categorize them, put them together, and then I come up with some activities or, or filling it out. So they're creating their own review session, and they love it. And so it, it makes it a little easier for me. And then they're answering their own questions in the class. So. They say, why was that there? Well, you asked for it, you know, and uh, it seems to work well. It's so simple to employ. So after class, I have the reflect, I haven't been watching my time, okay. A reflective discussion board, you know, where they have to discuss, I'll, I'll put a question, what I think is one of the really key things they should know for, remember from that lesson. I do a photo voice, which I'll tell more about that. Exam, essay, I started doing essays in my physics class, so it's really different and it's really powerful. OK, so reflective discussions. That says the same thing, I think. I'm going to skip that one. Photo voice. This, this is really cool. I, make them, I want them to think about physics all the time. So I want them, in your daily life, think about something from this chapter and take a picture of it. 
It could be as simple as a, as a ball, their, their dog pulling on something. If we're talking about friction, you know, one student who's pulling the dog along, who's pulling something on a, on a tile floor and on a carpet floor. And, and then they, they explain the physics about, about friction with that. But it could be for anything. This here happened to be one of my students uh, last year. This was his son. We were talking about Newton's first law, which something in motion will stay in motion until an external force, you know, causes it to change. Well, his son will run around the room continuously until either he, his wife, or a bowl of candy is put out, and then his son will stop moving. When he wrote that, I knew he got Newton's first law. I didn't have to explain it anymore. He got it. So now my students are thinking of the class all the time. You know, maybe you teach European history, and maybe there's no European kind of thing. Well, they could get a picture on the web, but it's much more, more powerful if they get something in their daily life. So um, that seems to work well. The students like it. I usually make that do the day of the exam review. So if, if the exam review sort of doesn't go so well or we go too quick, we pull these out and we go through these. But at least they're all posted so everyone can see everyone else's so they can read through other people's. And when they can link what they're learning in the book to what their real life, they can understand, hey, that's why we're teaching physics. So there's, there's a really a use for this. For the uh, exam essay questions, I decided, let me try to get some more writing in my class. So I would pick three problems that I normally would put numbers and have them calculate. I stripped out all the numbers and said, explain how to solve this problem. So this was like a circuit analysis, two different circuits, and one was about a capacitor. But they have to go step by step, but they get frustrated because there's, but I give it to them in advance. I say, bring it in, typed up, ready to go. You know, just turn it in at the exam. You don't have, so I know, I know they're going to collaborate, but that's okay because they're learning. They're going to learn these three things. I'm only going to grade one of them, and I don't know which one. So they can prepare all three. They can come in with nothing and just write it down in class, and, but now you're wasting exam time because you've got to answer this where you could have done it in advance. And you would think that every student would get 100% on this. The average is about 3.5 out of 5. I usually grade 5 points for these. So even though they've had the time to think about it, I like it because they're usually neat because they're not in the exam. They're scribbling, and I don't want to read through that. They'll type it up, make it nice for me. It's ready to go, and I just pick the one I want. The ones I don't use are usually problems that I'm going to do on a test that I have numbers with. So if they did this right, they could use that to help them. But by, at that point, they should know it. If they wrote all that, they should know how to do it. So it really kind of reinforces it, and they see a reason for it. So it was, uh, it, it, I, I don't make it worth more than 5 to 10 percent of the, of the exam scores. It's not going to skew the grades a lot, but I think it's really powerful in their learning. Because they tell me, as an engineer or as a scientist, you're going to have to explain what you did to, to non-scientists or non-engineers far more than to other engineers. So if you can't do that, you know, you're not going to be very effective. Learning Pod. I don't know if you know about this. This is a wonderful website. I've worked with them for the last couple years. It's an offshoot of the Kaplan, who runs the, the college board prep test you know, for people taking SAT and GRE and all that. They've developed a website, and it's totally free where they have over 50,000 high quality practice exercises in a number of disciplines. But if your discipline's not there, not to worry. Or if you don't like the questions, you can just create your own questions right there and they'll, they'll, they'll be part of their database, but they're perfectly happy. They love that if you do that. So one of my books, I had dinner with the CEO, just happened to be sitting next to her, told her what I'm using this open educational, wouldn't it be great if my book was in your thing? Over the summer, she had their people, and they took the whole book, all of the end of chapter problems, and put them in this system. So, um, it, so it worked out well for me for one of my classes. The other one, I just create my own problems. But it takes a little bit after you, I don't know if you ever used an online homework. It's very similar to that. You can give, uh, there's different types of questions. You have multiple choice, multiple select short answer, or a guided question. But you can give hints if you want. You can just leave it blank, or you can go really detailed. Uh, they actually hired me to create 100 questions in, in physics that weren't in the book, and so I did that last year. And I've, you know, sometimes it took a while to create a question and explain why each answer, why did you pick this answer? I had to pick the most common wrong answer. But you can take it where you want to, but if you're looking for a way, and this would be a wonderful add-on to a flip class, because in that reflective part where you want to see, did they really get it? You could have a couple problems here, and they could be really tailored to your campus and to your class. You could say, you know, in, you know, you could identify a lake that's near here, or you're in the, on the 13th floor of the library, and then you do something. Well, that many people have, they could see, they could really relate to that. So, uh, just, if you just Google learning pod, you can create a pod, which is a group of questions. So you could do it by chapter, and, and they're improving this all the time. 
So uh, mistakes to avoid. Keep your video short. Don't go more than 15 minutes. It's a proven fact that the longer it is, the less time they're going to watch. So make them short. If you need multiple, just, just take one topic. Break your whole lecture up. Just, well, this topic, this topic, and this topic. So if they got one, they could fly through it. They just they only have time for a short one. They don't have to go like fast forward and figure out where they were. I'll just watch this one. Really is much more better. It's much, much better. Uh, don't lecture. If they don't watch the videos, just move. Hey, you're, you're behind. You know, that's your fault. Everyone else did. I'm not going to. It's, it's, it's an injustice to the people that did the homework, then they have to sit there and you talk, and they're ready to go and engage and do something. Um, so, and hold them accountable for the work. And the way I found it is to collect things. So I do collect more paper than I ever did before, but I don't, I just look, you can kind of see what the answer is, if they're any close, if they're anywhere near the right answer, or I just to check that they turn something in. And uh, that seems to work, just for, for, it's amazing what students will do for a couple points. So I have a few recommendations. I think I meant start slow. You could test the water. You know, just do one lesson, one chapter. Uh, just do it occasionally. You know, I have one colleague that's going to flip, do Flip Friday, since every Friday is going to be her flip day. Or do it like me, do every, every single class period. It's a lot more fun. And I think if you do one of those earlier ones, you're going to naturally want to migrate to doing the whole course. But you don't have to start there. Uh, be flexible, okay? Be ready to change. As I mentioned, my students hated when I gave them an online quiz from the reading. So I gave them the Cornell notes and they love it. So a, different students, maybe next year the, the students will be different. I, mean, I don't know. So they're like Gumby there. You know, be, be a little flexible to adapt and ask them. I, I put a survey with every, every test at the back. You know, tell me how, what, what do you like? What, do you, what would you like to see changed? Often they're simple. One student said, don't write in red anymore because I'm colorblind and I can't see it. Well, I didn't know that. She never told me, but she, she wrote it down. Then I, I got it. I got rid of the red pens. Um, use, use technology where it's appropriate. Don't just use it, just, oh, we got it. We got all these things. Where, you, where it makes sense, use it. And there are some really good apps with the iPads. I know you're, you're moving to your iPad initiative. Uh, and there's a couple good uh, sites on the resource sheet. Doceri is a really good one. And there's, a, there's an app called Explain uh, Everything. Really good, good one for making really quick videos with a... On, on your iPad. Students don't do optional. You probably know that or experienced that. So give them a point, even a few of them, for anything, and they will do it. And I use a simple three, three point, three, two. So it's quick and easy. I don't have to think much. Uh, have fun. Be ready for increased engagement. If you don't want to interact with your students, this might not be the right thing for you. But you know, they'll definitely interact with themselves. But I think you'll really find, you know, we, we teach for, the reason we teach is we, we enjoy it. We want to see them successful and move forward. And when you actually engage with them and you figure out what their problem is, and it's so exciting to see a student that's struggling suddenly start to blossom and do better and better. Uh, you know something's working. And I think I mentioned this, yeah. So uh, don't accommodate them. If they didn't do it, they're stuck. So I had a student that w was an A student uh, before I flipped. I started, he wasn't doing all this. He said, oh, I don't have to do all this. He started getting C's. And I kept telling them, look, th this, this lady next to you, she was getting the C's before, and now she's getting A's. Why is that? You know, you're not doing it. This is real life. You know, that's the way you're going to have to learn. So um, an alternative, if maybe you don't want to flip your class, or in addition to that, what about flipping a meeting? If you have a meeting, what if everyone came to the meeting and they had already studied what you're going to talk about? You, could just, you don't have to explain the background. You just, we're going to jump right in. Here's a little video. You can, you can do a video of yourself talking about something. Then we're going to just going to, we're going to go act upon it. I'm, I'm trying to get our faculty council to do more of that. So when we get there, we all know what's going on. We can just work with that. Professional development. This would be a wonderful way. Show a bunch of things. Now we come to class. We're going to apply them. You're, you're going to actually create something based on that. I don't have to give you. You can cut the time down in half. You know, be much more effective. Or in your online classes. And I actually have a book. It's more about the the activities that you use. A little harder in there because you're not seeing them face to face anyways, but you can do kind of, some of the same techniques work just fine online. So uh, this is a resource guide, which, which I have on this, right here on this jump drive, which, which, which Jen had, and she's, you're gonna post them right on a, on a website for you all. Uh, I, re, I, do, I do have them posted already on this screencast, so it's on the cloud right now. Uh, I went through and got a bunch of the software and then just a bunch of articles that talked about flip learning. So if you have an interest, you certainly could just Google and find it, but I've sort of done that and picked the ones that I thought were the most useful that, that I, and I got things out of them. So you could just scan through those. Uh, that would give you a lot of, lot of extra reading. Um, 
I have a sheet that I got from uh, Lucy Kilbago from John Carroll University. I met her at a physics conference. She had a poster presentation. But she, she compared it with the cognitive psychology and education research, what they know in those areas about learning and how it applies to um, flip learning. I know I met a couple, at least one lady in here that, that teaches psychology. So um, anyways, you might be interested in that. And that, that's part of there, too. Um, uh, Holly Hunt from Florida State University put this together. Um, our QEP was the first year experience, and I was the QEP director, and I led the whole thing, so I went to a bunch of conferences. I met her. There's a 36 different proven classroom activities. Some are the think, pair, share, and assemble. There's a lot of good ideas. There's six pages. That's on that. That'll be there that you can just scan through. You won't like all of them. I don't like all of them, but there, there'll be one for be the right one for you. So if you're looking for, for some ideas and activities, whether you're flipping or not, you might just find something useful there. If you'd like to read some more about it, there's two really good books by John Bergman, The Flip Your Classroom, and The Flip Learning is his newest book. It just came out this summer. And then I just ordered, I got this book uh, last month, 101 Ways to Flip Your Online Class. It's like $10 or something, not very expensive. A lot of good ideas. Uh, to infuse an online class, but the activities, some of them work just fine in a flipped classroom. So I'd recommend any of those. They all can, you can get them all from Amazon. There is an organization called the Flip Learning Network. John Bergman is, is the, the head of that or runs that. They have a great website. They have a Ning, you know, which is a social media where they post different topics regularly, where you can, you can subscribe to that and you'll, you'll get emails about articles that you might interest you. They actually have an annual conference, the FlipCon. Last summer it was in Pittsburgh. And I was, I'd put a proposal, was gonna, I was gonna present pretty much this, this presentation there, but my, my dean wanted me to do something else. So I had, I had to go somewhere else. I had to go to Nebraska for a conference. So I couldn't go to that. But I heard it's a really good, it's mostly high school, but they do have higher education uh, tracks. And I think you'd, and they, they moved around a lot. So maybe it may be closer to here um, one summer. Uh, there is a website if you, if you don't want to go away, you'd, but you'd like to learn more and work on it. Crazy for Education, that's the one that did that brain thing that I talked about earlier. Uh, they, their, their motto is they are designed for, by flip teachers for flip teachers. Okay? Numerous resources for flip learning. They will host your video. You could post, it's in the cloud. If you don't like using the Blackboard or, or if you have a college space, I don't know, but if you want to keep it external, that, and sometimes there's reasons for that. Um, you can, they'll post them there. Um, the SOFIA is another organization. They actually have a certification program where you go four part, it's an online tutorial, self-paced, you do it on your own. They give you a quiz after each section. Then they want you to submit a, a class you flipped, your ideas for a clip. They will review it and give you comments. And it's free, okay? And they will give you a nice certificate. If you'd like to have a certificate frame, <laughs> That, that you've been trained and officially trained in flip learning, you can do that. So maybe you don't want to, you can't go off for professional development to a conference or something. You could do something like that. It would give you a lot of good ideas. There's some videos to watch, and the questions aren't hard. You know, and you can retake the quizzes, so it's, it's the mastery type. It's, it's not hard. So if that interests you, but that, that's available free. So it's, it's a great resource. So oops, now it's time for action. Okay. So. On the back of your page, hopefully if you, if you, I don't know if you took any notes, but if not, if you would turn this, oh, I see little apples on here. Those are supposed to be little, okay, well, I know you're, you're getting iPads and so, so maybe that's appropriate. Uh, those are supposed to be little boxes there, not little apples, but that's okay. Um, this was a sheet, and what I thought was, maybe you could spend, we could, yeah, we're doing good on time. I still have, I still have you for 20 more minutes. Um, fill this sheet, or start to fill this sheet out, okay? What courses would you think about trying to flip? Uh, when would you consider it? What activities would you consider doing? And um, when will you implement them? And I think I have another, yep. Yeah. So that's the sheet. I thought if you, would, if you wouldn't mind to take a few minutes, and we're gonna, we're gonna, you're gonna have to use this for the second activity. So if you choose not to do something, you're gonna have to wing it when we do the next one. But at least if you could think about it. Maybe this isn't for you, but maybe you know someone that it is, and that's okay. But, you know, I find if you, I've thought about it, much, I'm much more likely to do something than if I just saw someone, you know, hey, that, that guy gave a good presentation. You walk away, you never do anything. You file this, and then you're done with it. But I'd much rather, you, you, hey, for one lesson, for one topic of one lesson, I'm going to try flipping. I'm going to have them 
read something in advance. So I'm going to give you two minutes. I'm going to give well, this says five minutes. I'm going to give you a few minutes, all right, to fill out a few things where you think you might, where it could think about it. Then I have another activity to, to sort of engage you. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. And if you did the the draw, I guess they can still win the door prize, right? I'm gonna give you the. It's a two-minute warning now. You have two more minutes. I like it so you so you can gauge where you're going. Then we're gonna we're gonna you're gonna discuss it with somebody. Okay, uh, you have one more minute. We can try to wrap up your last thought here, then we're, we'll, we'll move to, to our second activity. Okay, okay. We got one more thing to do before. Okay, I know you're probably still feverishly writing, but we're in the interest of moving on. We're going to do a 45-second rendezvous, and you could use this as an exam review or after you, you've had a certain topic, just get students to, to get engaged and to talk. And so you're going to model it now. And what we're going to ask you to do is to stand up, to pair up with someone. If you're, it's okay to have three, but two is much better, okay? And then just, just to get it so you don't have to spend half the time figuring out who goes first. We'll have the shortest person listen first. The taller person will talk. And I just tell that person something on your sheet, what you got out of this, what you're thinking of doing. They'll listen intently. And then I'll do a little chime, and then we'll, 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 we'll change places here. But you can have, certainly have a dialogue. You might be thinking some, exactly what she's thinking, but doing it a different way. You might get a great idea. Does that sound OK? So you have to stand up. You think better when you're on your feet anyways and pair up with somebody that's near you. <laughs> Okay, swap now. If you're the shortest person, you talk.
Okay. Okay. Could, could you sense a, a, a sense of excitement in here? Yeah. That this is what my class is like usually. The students are they might be sitting down, they might all be standing up unless I do this activity, but just in doing their their, their normal things that, that we do in class. It can be that noisy and that engaging. And hopefully you got some good ideas from chatting with someone else. Often they'll have thought it, but just a little different way, and that might add to what you're doing. So, and you could do this multiple. You could say, now go find another partner. We, we could do it again or so. I've done it sometimes two or three times in a row, but you can see. But I think you could apply it in your class, too, in, in whatever you're doing, or in a summary at the end of the class, or maybe right at the beginning. Ask them what, whatever you read. Tell someone what you read about before the class, before we start. So there's a number of different ways you could use something like that. So uh, here's a quote from Einstein, being a physicist, you know, um, but it is the, the supreme art of the teacher to awaken joy in creative expression and knowledge. I think that's one of the big things that the flip allows you to be so much more creative. There's so many different ways, tools you can use, and thinking about things in a different way. It's not the standard lecture anymore. How can I make this more engaging? And then when, it, when something doesn't work out, well, how do I fix it? You know, or ask the students. Give them a three by five card. Tell me, how could this be improved? If, if, if something really fell flat, ask them. Sometimes they're, they're the best people to tell you, hey, we, we needed more of this or so forth. So hopefully we've lit more lights. Hopefully you've seen a vision. You don't have to look under one light for what you're going to do in your class. That I, I've, Open the door. Obviously, they don't have all the things here, but you're willing to maybe step out because there are other lights where there's other things that you could use in your classrooms. So here's my parting advice to you. Try it. You'll like it. And so will your students. You know, that's the old ad from Alka-Seltzer. So um, I'm certainly open for any questions. And then we have some door prizes that we're going to pull from. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, when I group them, different assignments and I group them, it seems the A students get very excited and they show their knowledge. Those weak students, the C and D, they resent it because they think five are not being taught by the professor, rather by the students. The students, they sit appear like better than me and uh, they don't want to listen to them. And, Mm -hmm. Why is this guy just simply doing this? <laughs> that, that's a great question. You really need a sales pitch at first to explain them, to show them, to model what you're going to do. You know, I don't know, maybe it could have been the, the topic you were doing then. Uh, is that, is that statistic, a statistic using, a, for example, research idea and collect that and analyze it on the manipulate number in the classroom? Okay. I've gotten where I wouldn't put all the, the slower students together. I would no, no, mix, you mix, them. you've divided them. The good students with, the with the bad one, with the lower one, not the bad one. Okay. Well, I don't know exactly how it was all implemented, but certainly if there was more reading, if there was stuff they did before so they could pull out their notes where they kind of guided them along. But you're always going to have the slower students, but mine, they, 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 they kind of listen, and the, the smarter ones, or the, 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 more, the ones that, are, that pick it up quicker, seem to be able to engage the other students. Uh, I, don't, I, let, I let my students self-select. I don't, I don't pick their own so partners. Okay, partner with the people you want? Try that. See how that goes, because... Um, you know, then obviously if it's a one group that they're all the really slow learners, you might have to spend more time with them. But I'd rather they feel comfortable in that group than having some smart aleck or someone that they don't get along with. 
so that would be be one way to do, or, or rotate them around every other so they're always going with someone else. But so there's something about being with familiar familiar people that they usually whoever they sit with the first day in class they're with them the whole term, and they become close and they share you know emails and stuff. So that might be a be an approach you could try. Yes, ma'am. Well, students, especially at the beginning, they'll say, hey, I don't like this. This is not what I paid money for this class for. Yeah. But I show, the first time I did, but now I can show them the results. Hey, last year, look, your last your example, my last exam, they did one and a half grades higher than the, the same ex exam that I gave last year when I didn't flip. I said, you're getting better grades, and that's, that's really the motivator for them. So it, it is, a, especially the first week of class, to model it. And to be, if you're going to collect something, be sure you collect it so you, you set, set the standard. Then it can roll right along. But uh, it is a little bit of salesman and explaining, but you could, there's plenty of research, there's pl plenty of studies where people have done it at MIT or Princeton or, or Harvey Mudd or whatever. You can say, look, this is what they're doing, and look at the results they're getting. We're going to try this. But be willing to adapt. Say, well, if you don't like it, what don't you like? What could we change? We're not going to have me up front, but you're gonna, you can go watch all my 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 presentation is online, so it's available for you 24-7. Yeah, you set up the expectations. This is what we're going to do. This is the way it is. You're stuck with it. If you don't like it, find a different instructor. But you know, you don't want to throw them out. But and none of mine do. I mean, my my enrollments keep going up. In fact, I had to bring extra chairs in my class to fit all the students in, which which the fire code. I don't tell them about it. But I think I, I don't want to make a student wait a year to take my my physics one again. Okay. Just use those statistics. Tell them, look, this is proven. Trust me. We're going to go through this. There'll be some hiccups. And, but if it, what you don't like, let me know. We'll, we'll modify it. That's where you need to be that gumby. Be a little flexible. If they don't like one part of it, try something different. But when they see they're getting support from you and from the activities, there's a reason they read something. There's a reason they did the activity. Then there's a reason the homework. It just kind of all fits together. And when, when you can match them up, it, it just seems to, something magical happens. It just seems to work really well. But it, it is work, I don't want to, it is work to set it up and to start. You know, I spend, it's sort of like adopting, a, starting a brand new course with a new textbook. You know how much extra stuff you have to do to get ready? Because now you have to plan, what are they going to do before class? You got to plan, what are they going to do in class? And what are they going to do outside of class? So you, you have those three things to plan, which often that way, but you'd have to do all of that stuff. But once it's set up, you've got it. You re-roll it next year, and, and you got a lot of those things done. So, you know, that's why doing, like I'm doing three classes for the first time. This That's quite a bit. That, I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. I would say do one or do parts of one. That's the best way. Just like when I first went into using Open Educational Resource, OER, I got the book. I just, hey, for the next chapter, we're going to use this other book. I'm going to give you the book. I'm going to give you the chapters. And, and the students loved it, and it worked much better. So then the next year, I, I adopted it completely. But I didn't jump in with both feet and, you know, and, and hold my nose and just go and see what happens. I like tested. I tried it out a little bit. So as long as you're ready for more engagement, it's good. But if you, if you don't want to interact with the students, then this might not be the, the very best, because you're going to get more engagement. But that's what's fun. That's what makes it exciting, and to see them be successful.